Welcome ladies. We are excited to begin a new thing here for Harvest Women. We are going to have a Harvest Women's podcast. So part of that is we will do several mini series along the way to shepherd and guide, maybe inform in different topics that I have felt the need within our body or others have expressed. And one of the things God put on my heart this year, as I've watched different women within our church take steps that God has put in their lives is to shepherd in a way to love our sisters better. And so our first mini series is called Love Your Sisters. And we have three uh, different podcasts for this series covering different avenues that God has allowed in the lives of women in all communities, but in our church family as well. And my greatest heart's desire, my prayer for this is that it would inform our women better to be more intentional and loving in their relationships, in their prayer life, and in their support of each other within the body of Christ. So our first one is this one, and it is love your sister as she endures a season of miscarriage or infertility. And I want to welcome our guests, uh, and I'd love for you to introduce yourself in case the women of Harvest don't know you. So Allie, why don't you go first? Uh, so I'm Allie Angle. I have been coming to Harvest for four and a half years. Uh, we came here because my husband Jonathan accepted the youth pastor position here. And so we've been here since 2019 and I am 30 years old and we have no children on this side of um, eternity. And so, yeah, that's where we're at. I was a teacher for six years and it was not what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. <laughs> so I stopped and that allowed me to be more involved here at Harvest. I teach some of the women's equip and mm -hmm. I'm involved with our teenagers and I work part-time at a local boutique. So yeah. that's a little bit about me. And Allie is the small group leader for one of my daughters yep. and a dear friend and on the teaching team. So, yeah. so glad to have you. Sam? Yeah, I'm Sam Johnson. My husband and I have been coming to Harvest since we were dating in 2012. <laughs> And then we got married and moved to Phoenix, Arizona. And we went to a harvest out there for six years. We moved back in 2020 and came back to harvest. So we've been here ever since. I was a teacher too. For, oh. Yeah. Until we moved back. We moved and back. And me too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Halfway through the school year, we moved back in 2020. So things just had to shift. And mm. it shifted in a way that I uh, also changed jobs, which was a great, uh, worked out super well. But yeah. And your family? We have one baby. Mm -hmm. He's 18 months old. Yes. Uh, and it was, we were thrilled to have you guys come back. Your mm -hmm. husband plays piano at times up on the yes. worship and team. drums. And yeah. drums. So yeah, your family is seen probably in different ways, but sometimes. Yeah. And we're small group leaders. Yeah. So yeah. Awesome. Well, wonderful. Well, I would love you to just begin by telling a bit of your story and walking us through. This is one that I share with you ladies. Um, and I'll sometimes jump in on some things because I have mutual experiences mm -hmm. of my own on this topic. Uh, but I want to let them hear from you and what God brought you through. And um, then we'll kind of dive in a little bit more on how we as a body can uh, come alongside. So Sam, why don't you tell us your story? Okay. Um, we moved back to Indiana at the end of 2019, um, and we were just thrilled to be back around family again, but very sad to have left Phoenix, had a mm -hmm. lot of close relationships out there. So it was hard to, hard to leave that, but exciting to be back around people we love as well. And we felt ready to start having kids. I was 31, so starting a little later, um, but... God blessed us and we got pregnant right away. And I just remember feeling so much hope and excitement because 2020 was hard mm -hmm. for everyone, but we were going through several other things as well. So just like the, the move and the big life change, mm -hmm. switching jobs, it was just a lot. So it felt like a bright ray of hope. And it was during COVID, so Bryce couldn't come to any of the appointments, but I remember the first appointment went really well. It was a little later because they were spreading out appointments as well. So we went in at about 10 weeks and the baby already had arms and legs and was kicking and moving and had a great heartbeat and everything was great. Um, and that's when we told our family mm -hmm. because the appointment went so well. We were almost to 12 weeks, which is like the magic is, number yeah. of like, oh, you're good now. You can tell everyone. Right. So we started telling people um, and continued. Everything seemed to be going well, but 
we went in at 16 weeks for just a normal checkup and Bryce stayed in the car because he couldn't come in. It was COVID and they couldn't find a heartbeat. Mm. Um, and I remember the doctor like spending an extra long time just looking and trying and Mm -hmm. kept telling us like, you know, that's, I think the baby's there. I think I hear movement. Like, let's just get you into an ultrasound and see, like, let's, let's, I think there, I think the baby's there. Like there was just still hope. So mm-hmm. Bryce didn't even come in at that point. Cause I was like, the doctor still thinks it's fine. Like, so we went back for the ultrasound. I remember it took just a long time. Mm-hmm. There was just so much like whispering in the hallway and just like, it's just this feeling of fear, just like mm-hmm. drawing in on me. And we went back for the ultrasound and the baby was, was gone. There was just, he was still. Mm -hmm. Um, before there had been so much life and so much movement and the sound of the heartbeat and then it was just nothing it was quiet and the nurse just said I'm so sorry Mm. Um, and Bryce they brought Bryce in and the doctor came in and since we were so far along um, 16 weeks you know that's second trimester you're Mm -hmm. almost halfway there they we had two options we could either have a surgery and they would just remove the baby or we could go into the hospital and deliver the baby Um, and we, there wasn't like a lot of time to think about it. It was like, Mm -hmm. you just need to make this decision. Um, and we were just in so much shock and we decided we would rather have the baby Mm -hmm. so that we could just have a few moments with, with the baby that, Mm -hmm. you know, we had cared so much for. And, um, so we decided on that. So they told us we'd come in the next day. Um, and I remember up until that point, Bryce and I were just like in shock. We Mm -hmm. hadn't cried. We were just like in complete shock that what was happening and we went out to the car and we both just broke Mm. down um with the realization of what happened but then also just having to make all the phone calls to all the people and tell them that like this bright spot of hope in a really dark time Mm. was being taken and that we weren't going to have a baby um and the next day we gathered all our things for the hospital like we thought we would be doing in 20 more weeks and we went to the hospital and it was just a really traumatic time Mm -hmm. um they had to induce labor it was a missed miscarriage so Mm -hmm. nothing was happening naturally so they Mm -hmm. had to induce labor I was in labor for several hours I started bleeding just so much bleeding and they didn't really know why that wasn't something that normally happened um so it was scary. Um, I was losing a lot of blood. I finally had the baby, but they had to cut the umbilical cord. And I was like, mm. how is this happening? Wow. Like, it just felt even more real at that point yeah. because, again, like, I think when you think of miscarriage, you think you just have a period and mm-hmm. then the, the baby's gone. But it was like I had this little tiny baby. Mm. And I remember they handed the baby to me, and it was just like this tiny little baby that fit mm-hmm. in the palm of your hand. But it was perfect you know it Mm -hmm. had arms and legs and it was a baby it was just so tiny and but the placenta wouldn't come out and Mm -hmm. um hours later I was still bleeding and I had lost so much blood that they were Mm -hmm. about to have to do a blood transfusion at that point they said like we just need to do a surgery and like end this so your body can will stop bleeding Mm -hmm. um because I was so weak and so tired and So we finally just ended up doing the surgery, which I didn't want to do just because of scar tissue forming Mm -hmm. and all the things Mm -hmm. they say. So I was trying to avoid it, but we did the surgery and um, got the placenta out and and then they brought the baby back out a little while later so we could just have some time together Mm -hmm. as a family. And they made like little cars with little baby's footprints Mm -hmm. on it and, Mm -hmm. um, and, we just got to be together for a little bit as a family, and um, and then that was it. We like left the maternity ward of the hospital mm-hmm. with no baby, and um, that took a long time to heal from. My body just it took a long time to regulate again. It took a long time to just even just stop bleeding again. Mm-hmm. Like it just was a long, drawn out process, um, and. Probably six months later, we got pregnant again, and we would go on to lose another baby at about 12 weeks, and that was the the very end of 2020. Again, it was a missed miscarriage, so we had to be induced, but at least I was able to have 
that baby from home. Um, and then the next year, 2021, we just took the year getting healthy again. I mm -hmm. went through a lot of tests. I was probably at the hospital like once a week for two months, mm -hmm. getting blood drawn, just mm -hmm. tr them trying to see if my hormones would regulate and they wouldn't. So finally, after like months, I remember my arms were bruised mm -hmm. from how much blood I gave, just trying to figure out why my hormones weren't regulating. And then um, we did a little surgery, um, all kinds of things, just them trying to find anything and they never really found um, a reason. So eventually it was just that we knew that we would have to, that we would just have to keep trying and mm -hmm. see what, what God would do. Um, so it took us about a year to get pregnant again and we got pregnant at the end of 2021. And I remember it was a hard, like we thought Ooh. we lost Finn so many times. Ooh. I bled so much through that pregnancy. Any amount of bleeding you're not supposed to have, I had it all. I had implant bleeding. I had mm -hmm. a subchorionic hemorrhage. I think they call it like there were just so many things. And we thought so many times that that baby was gone. I remember I even canceled my first appointment because wow. I was like, I've, I'm bleeding. The baby's gone. I don't need to come in. And I remember a nurse called me and convinced me. Like, she was like, I just want you to come in. Oh, God. And she convinced me to come in, and the baby was still there. Mm -hmm. And that was probably the, the first appointment where everything really, really looked good. Like, before I thought they were fine, but this mm -hmm. one, like, the baby was right where he was supposed to be and growing at the right mm -hmm. consistency. Like, all the things lined up and... Uh, in June of 2022, we had Finn. Mm. And we have had a miscarriage since Finn as well. And um, we're just in the process of trying to figure out, you know, will we will we have more? Will we have another baby? And yeah. just waiting to see what God does. Yeah. How do you process through the wanting to have hope mm -hmm. with a new pregnancy with the fear of what you've gone through? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is, it is so hard. I think now I can cling to more. I can see Finn and I can look at him and I can hold Finn. Mm -hmm. And he is like kind of hope personified, right? Like we've had a baby, this has happened. Before Finn, it was even harder because mm -hmm. I was like, it just might not happen. Mm -hmm. I know people people say, you know, I well, I've had a miscarriage and I had a baby. You just have to keep trying, you'll get there. But it might right. not, right. like it might not happen. Mm -hmm. um, so in those moments, it was just, uh, it was just knowing that that God is faithful, regardless of whether or not we have a baby, regardless mm -hmm. of whether or not we have another miscarriage, God is faithful. Mm -hmm. And I remember just lots of songs and, and scriptures that I would just repeat over and over mm -hmm. just to remind myself that no matter what, God is faithful. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. and we just knew parts of that along the way, but <clears throat> watching God be faithful and watching you and Bryce walk it well also and um, with... Um, integrity of your heart and w with your small group. And um, so thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, Allie, how about you tell us your story? Yeah, so uh, our story also started in 2020. We got married in 2017 at the end of the year. And so we were kind of waiting to start trying to grow our family until we knew where Jonathan was going to end up and, you know, just didn't want to be in the midst of transition. So uh, we started trying to get pregnant at the beginning of 2020, and we were obviously very excited, and we're finally on the same page with, are we ready? And, you know, ready. Mm -hmm. And uh, just wanting that, you know, being here. And so we were really excited, and I knew, I knew that even if you're healthy, you don't always get pregnant right away. So... For me, everything was looking good. I had like a pre-pregnancy appointment mm -hmm. uh, and everything looked good and my hormones were fine. And so I felt pretty good about trying. And so fa fast forward about 10 months, I think in October, we got to the point where I was like, I know everything's normal with me. I know that my body's doing what it's supposed to be doing. I'm tracking it. And so I actually ended up calling my nurse and I was like, is there anything that we can do you know, just precautionary tests that we can do. And she said yes. And so in November, we found out that uh, Jonathan's sperm count was zero and everything on my end was good. And we were just floored by mm -hmm. that. I think, 
you most often think of infertility issues being on the mom's side. You know, you're the one that carries the baby and all the things. And so that just came out of like left field. We were not expecting it. And uh, our nurse actually recommended that we do another test because she just was like, really? And so we did it again and again. It was zero. So at the beginning of 2021, we got our sort of diagnosis. So Jonathan's body just doesn't make sperm the way that it's supposed to. And for all of the testing that we've done, there's really no reason, which is good because you don't want something to be wrong per se, but also frustrating because we don't really know why. So uh, that year in 2021, we kind of started pursuing uh, like a natural holistic route, thinking that maybe there was something, you know, underlying Mm -hmm. that. And uh, which ultimately didn't change anything. But we loved our doctor and he (laughs) is a believer and walked with us really well and actually helped us kind of take our next step, which was uh, kind of going in to see what was going on. So Mm -hmm. Jonathan in the summer of 2022 had a biopsy and there we learned that his body has everything that it needs to produce sperm, mm-hmm. but for whatever reason, it just all falls apart. Mm-hmm. And so we were able to see fragments of them, but nothing whole that was viable or mm-hmm. usable. And at our first appointment, when we got our diagnosis, our urologist, Jonathan's urologist, gave us some options. So in that appointment, we find out there's a you probably will never have biological children. So mm-hmm. We got that news. And so, you know, like you talked about, like just the shock of Mm -hmm. all of these different results and things. And we were just like, what? You know, just again, did not see that coming. And he said, you know, there's another procedure that you can pursue that is very invasive. It's $30,000 out of pocket. And there's a very small chance that it's successful. And so we were like, don't really, you know, have that. (laughs) And he said, you know, you can adopt traditionally, you can do embryo adoption, or, you know, you can just not pursue kids. And we were like, what's embryo adoption? Mm -hmm. And so that's where we heard about embryo adoption for the first time. And for those that don't know, embryo adoption is where there are embryos that are Uh, left over Mm -hmm. from people's IVF cycles. And for whatever reason, they're not going to be used by the couple. And so they can choose to donate their embryos to couples like us, where as far as we know, I can carry a baby uh, and we can give those babies an opportunity at life Mm -hmm. because they're frozen. Like they're just sitting in a lab somewhere and they're not dead, but they're also not living. Mm -hmm. And that option was so appealing to us, not only because of the desire to want to carry babies, but also just when I think of the least of these, like Mm -hmm. they fall into that category. Yes, absolutely. And so uh, when we found out, when we came to the end of the road of probably biological children not being part of our story, we knew that that is where the Lord was leading us. Mm -hmm. So we started pursuing that, and we are going through an organization called the National Embryo Donation Center. It's in Knoxville, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. I love everyone there. It's a Christian (laughs) organization, and we love our doctor and our nurse, and Mm -hmm. just everyone there has made it such a good experience. And with the National Embryo Donation Center, you have to go through a home study. They treat it like... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. an adoption because it's a baby. Right. And so uh, they give all the embryos and babies just dignity by Mm -hmm. treating it like a traditional adoption. So we went through all of that. It's a very long process Mm -hmm. for those that have adopted or are pursuing. Like it just takes a lot longer than you think. Yep. And so uh, we, this past summer in May, we matched with our donor couple. And then what most people don't know is that we did our first um, embryo transfer in August, and I got pregnant, Mm -hmm. and then we ended up having a miscarriage in September. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we sit from a point also where it's like there's so much that comes with infertility and the loss of 
of having biological children and then having this, you know, mm-hmm. hopeful option. Right. And uh, <clears throat> just that also sort of working because I did get pregnant. And I, you know, that's something that I forget mm-hmm. is that I did get pregnant and it worked. And like, I'm a mom. Yeah. Um, we just can't see and hold our babies. So uh, that's where we're at now. And so, mm-hmm. you know, Jonathan and I are in this, in this place where we're still very much in this right. and we haven't, you know, arrived and been on the other side of it. And, uh, like, you know, just what you said, like, you just don't know if it's going to happen. And, you know, that's been one of the hardest things to wrestle through. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're just, and that just happened this fall. So very much in a, uh, raw, tender place place still. And I know that really, no matter how long ago you lose a baby, it's always tender in different Mm -hmm. ways and at different times. And that sadness doesn't go away. So that's where we're at. Yeah. And to add to it, it's an interesting thing for you and Jonathan to juggle because you are known within the church well and to how, um, just explain how you process through how to share and when to share and maybe why. Because mm-hmm. I understand it and we've walked this together. Mm-hmm. Um, but it might be good for others who know and love you to understand kind of how you guys came to those conclusions. Yeah, so when we first uh, started trying to get pregnant, we kind of sat down and we're like, so are we going to share with people that this mm-hmm. is where we're at? And we kind of went back and forth, you know, Couples have freedom to choose right. how they handle that. There's really no biblical, like, this is sin if you don't tell people, or it's sin if you, you know, right. all that. But we decided that we were just going to share with some of our uh, close friends and our families. Mm-hmm. Just, you know, we want this, we're pursuing this, and... Basically, my thinking was, we'll let you know when we're pregnant, right. you know. <laughs> and so we did decide to tell people, but we didn't decide to tell, you know, right. everybody. And so then when the infertility diagnosis came and it started to drag mm-hmm. on, you know, uh, we had that conversation again, you know, how mm-hmm. vulnerable are we going to be? How many people are we going to tell? What's the nature of this going to look like? And, and you know, at that point, people look at you and you're like, you know, you've been married for about four years. It's a little long. <laughs> they start asking the questions. You know, yeah. Yep. And so uh, God protected us a lot. Mm-hmm. I have never really gotten a lot of uh, unhelpful and hurtful comments, mm-hmm. uh, I, which I know a lot of people do. And, I'm, you know, it just makes me sad. But I think after I got a couple of like, oh, don't you just have baby fever like looking and all Mm -hmm. it's like okay I kind of want to get out ahead of this correct and just we're going to eliminate that because Mm -hmm. if people know then they are less likely to say things like that Mm -hmm. and and also that has been the the way that God is sanctifying us the most Mm -hmm. through our infertility and we just got to the point where it was like to be honest with people we can't leave this out this is what God is using in our life right now and we can't separate mm-hmm. our infertility from the rest of our life. Right. And so we decided to share. Mm-hmm. Uh, we decided to start kind of telling people um, as it would come up or, you know, just kind of in conversation and ended up also just sharing on Instagram mm-hmm. as I knew that I had friends that were dealing with infertility and just started to become aware of a th- it's a thing. It is. It's a thing. And that a lot of people feel like they shouldn't share and can't or right. don't want to. It has a stigma. Yeah, yeah. and so. and I just, I just wanted to, I don't know. I, I don't want to say that I'm like an infertility like advocate or whatever, right. but just that people know like this is a like this is a thing. Yeah, and and this is the thing that a lot of people deal with, mm-hmm. and you know we just decided that we're gonna share. Yeah. Well, you know it's interesting because. My children know that our story has years of infertility. Mm-hmm. 
and miscarriage attached to it. But it's been good for them to watch you and Jonathan Mm -hmm. because all of our story is in the past to them. And so they've lived it more real life with you guys and with one of my daughters being in your small group. It has been a wonderful example of how to walk it and be honest about the hurt. I think we do a disservice to hard places to Mm -hmm. just say everything's great because in that moment it's hard, Mm -hmm. but in the hard to worship the Lord. Mm -hmm. And teens need to see that, and Mm -hmm. you both have walked it very well. It's going to make me a little emotional because I just appreciate it as a mom to my kids Mm -hmm. watching you. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, Speaking of God's role in this, which is all over it. Mm -hmm. We trust him with all the parts. And it's interesting, I think, at points to look back and think, oh, I didn't see that coming. You know, it was those shocked moments. But if you were to look back and think of your story, where did God prepare you for what you're going through in or went through um, in that? Allie, why don't you start with this one? Yeah, so I think... That preparation for us, you know, on top of, I'm really thankful that Jonathan and I both are walking with the Lord. Right. Uh, and, you know, apart from stuff like that, uh, I I can really see God starting to prepare us when Jonathan was in seminary. He went to Faith Bible Seminary up in Lafayette, mm-hmm. out of Faith Church, and they do a lot of biblical counseling. They equip their people very well to understand theological Mm -hmm. things. And that was so helpful. Looking back, I had never really dug into what is theology? Like, why is it important to know who God is Mm -hmm. and to study him and, and to understand his character, his ways, how the world works in light of him being at the center of everything. And at faith is where I, I did that for the first time and Mm -hmm. just had women who were helping me understand that. And also Jonathan, part of his MDiv was going through counseling training and Mm -hmm. doing counseling, getting hours. And I also was able to take uh, some counseling training in my time there And Jonathan and I, so many times we've looked at each other and thought just like, can you imagine going through this not having learned those things? And obviously, couples do, you know, not everyone has that, uh, not everyone goes to seminary and not Mm -hmm. everyone has that theological training, Um, but I'm, it was, it was a gift Mm -hmm. and that set us up really well um, just to cling to what's true about God because mm-hmm. it's hard right. and also to help kind of counsel each other and just to walk through things with the mindset of what does God say about this mm-hmm. and not to cling to my feelings, which I'm very good mm-hmm. at <laughs> and it's very tempting to do just to live out of how I feel. Right, And so God used that theological training. And even though I wasn't getting my MDiv, I would love when Jonathan mm-hmm. would come home from class on Thursday. I'm like, what did you guys talk about? Mm-hmm. So I did learn a lot from that. And just the people that God put in our lives in that season. And also just God knew that part of being at Harvest was going to be being loved by the people here. Mm-hmm. And it blows my mind how God just goes before us in ways that we don't know. And we so badly wanted to be at Harvest because we love the church. We loved the model of discipleship here. And, you know, that God brought us here before we knew that there was anything wrong. And in that, you know, we've been just blessed by people that get it. Mm -hmm. You know, like you and Brian get it and – you know, you get it, even though we've never really talked about it until right now. Uh, but there are a lot of couples and mm-hmm. families at Harvest that have walked the road of infertility. Right. And God knew mm-hmm. that we were going to be blessed by that. And even by the people that have not dealt with infertility, we've just been so well loved by mm-hmm. the people here. 
And so I just think of the theological training and just the people Mm -hmm. that God put in our lives before this was all going to be a thing for us. Right, which speaks such truth into we don't know what is coming Mm -hmm. and to put ourselves first into the word and under his teaching and then surrounding ourselves with believers because we don't know what the next thing he's preparing us for. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to women who are listening, that might be a word of encouragement to them of press into theology Mm -hmm. sooner, get into the word regularly, surround yourself, whether that's life group or a different group Mm -hmm. with believers, because we don't know next seasons when God does, but his ways are there for us to take advantage of at any time. So that's good. How about you, Sam? Yeah, we had um, really close friends in Phoenix, Jacob and Kylie Fletcher. And the year before we moved back, they had experienced a couple of Mm. miscarriages. um, And we were best friends with them. So we walked very closely with Mm. them through that. Um, And soon after we had our first miscarriage, we went back out to Phoenix to see them. And they had had their first baby. Oh. So we got to see God just faithfully work in their mm-hmm. lives through a couple of really hard miscarriages and then see the baby that God brought into their life mm-hmm. and, and be able to hold that baby and celebrate with them. And um, I just remember them speaking so much truth into our lives about like it's hard, and um, but God is faithful. Mm-hmm. And no matter what the outcome is, God is faithful. And if you do get the chance to have a baby, you're going to love that baby so, mm-hmm. so much because you're going to know what a gift and miracle that baby is. So it was just a sweet time to like be able to walk through something hard with them Mm -hmm. and get to see what God did. And then they walked through that with us from a distance, but still us just being able to look back and know that like they had done this. And and even just like her sharing so vulnerably what her miscarriage was Mm -hmm. like helped me when I got to, when I was in experiencing it, just being able to say like, I know what it's like because Kylie went through it and she Mm -hmm. shared with me. Um, so I, it's just so cool to see how God like wove that story into Mm -hmm. our lives and allowed us to be there with them and then them with us on the other side. And those things do bond us, those Mm -hmm. deep places, the valleys Mm -hmm. in life and It speaks so to not being surfacey with our friends, Mm -hmm. right? Like to really just let them in because we all have the hard and the ugly, right? And and we actually are drawn toward people more when they look less perfect. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So I love that. I love how the body works even across miles, right? Where you, you know, moving Mm -hmm. you to a place or moving you away from a place. Mm -hmm. God was faithful in both. Yes. Mm -hmm. Isn't that beautiful? I love that. So within the body, you have been so gracious, and there have been a lot of really good things that you've shared, that things that are um, have d- been done well or exhibited in Christ-like love. But if you were to, again, this is kind of a shepherding series, give encouragement within the body to other women of how can they know how to love well, whether someone is going through infertility or in a miscarriage? What are some things they could do and know, perhaps, um, that might be helpful to um, love their sister better? Um, Either of you can go if you have a thought. Um, I think I shared this earlier, but one thing that was probably not helpful was just people telling us that, like, Mm -hmm. you'll have a baby. It'll Mm -hmm. happen for you. Just Mm -hmm. relax. It's all going to be okay. Like, just try again. Or when are you going to try again? Like, Mm -hmm. all of those things were difficult because before Finn, we really didn't know. They couldn't pinpoint anything. There was a big possibility that we just couldn't have a baby Mm -hmm. um, in the way that, you know, we, we wanted to at the time, you know. So I think that was just not the most helpful thing. And it was more helpful when people were just there with us, Mm -hmm. just cried with us, prayed with us, um, and spoke of God's true hope, you know, Mm -hmm. Christ, not, not saying you will, you have hope in having a baby because that's not true. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad that you said that. That's something that I have thought a lot about is, you know, just when it, and it's out of a desire to love and Mm -hmm. to be there for you. And so I don't want anyone to, that's listening or (laughs) to, to be like, oh my word, I said that to someone yesterday, Mm -hmm. you know, because the reality is we're all growing. No one is trying to hurt Mm -hmm. you. Yep. It's out of a desire to love you. Mm-hmm. And so if you have said any of these things or I'm just, it's okay, you know, 
we're all, like you said, we're all learning. Mm -hmm. And this is a hard thing to handle. It is. And, and it's hard because, you know, what's helpful for one person may not be helpful for another. Everyone handles infertility a little bit differently. Right. And so just want to say that. But uh, I think that what you said just – when people offer you hope where hope really isn't found, mm -hmm. you know, I know you're going to have a baby. I know it's going to happen for you. It, it, it takes everything inside of me to be like, no, you don't. You don't right. know that that's going to happen. <laughs> right. You can't. You're not right. God. You're you not don't God. know. Yep. And, and so I think just what's most helpful is pointing women and men who are dealing with infertility right. to where hope is, which is in Christ, and in that the Lord is faithful no matter the outcome. And, you know, just being there is helpful. I think also something that has not been helpful, and this was especially in the midst of when we knew that there were issues, we didn't really know why, when people would be like, well, just adopt. And it's like, okay. <laughs> You know, first of all, there is a desire. Like, God created us mm -hmm. at the beginning to be able to have biological babies. That's how he designed it. Mm -hmm. And infertility is a result of brokenness, mm -hmm. of sin. And so it's not as simple as, like, well, just adopt, mm -hmm. you know? That doesn't make it go away. Right. And also, adoption is not just, like, some slap a band-aid right. on it it's if you want a baby fix. just go get one right yeah. you know exactly. Down at the there's so store. much yeah <laughs> yes there is it's so impressive. much to adoption and it it's is. not you don't adopt just because correct i'm sad and i want a baby right there's so much you to it adopt for yes right. <laughs> and so i think and it also can just feel dismissive mm -hmm. like i know you're sad but just go get a baby somewhere and you'll feel better right. you know it's like well no, it's you more know, complicated than that. yeah, yep. and so I think just being sensitive mm -hmm. and also, you know, just being being mindful of like you just don't know where people are at, right? right. Mm -hmm. We can't assume that just because couples don't have babies, well, mm -hmm. they just must not want them, right? <laughs> That's probably not true. Yeah, most it likely might be. Not, but, it might be. Right. Uh, but most likely, it's not, and. You just want to be sensitive. And those comments, uh, you know, the baby fever comments. And, mm -hmm. you know, you've been married. Oh, you just had your fourth anniversary? Like, when are you going to start trying to have kids? Like, well, we started yeah. two years ago. Yeah, right. yeah. And so just being aware. And, and I know that those comments are out of a desire to, like, make light of, some, you know, a yeah. conversation like light. And, better. yeah, mm -hmm. and, you know. Because families and babies are a wonderful thing, right. you know. Mm -hmm. And but I think just to think before we speak, mm -hmm. you know, just not everyone can pop out a baby whenever they would like to. Right. So yeah, yeah. I think um, one of the things I learned was to say when I'm meeting someone, tell me about you and your family, because mm -hmm. a family can be a couple, mm -hmm. and that can be where they yeah. live. It could be what they do, but it is an open ended versus mm -hmm. do you yes. have any children <clears throat> and. That's a very simple little tweak we can do within a body of mm -hmm. when we're meeting someone and getting to know them. Tell me about you and your family right. versus do you have children? Mm -hmm. uh, and I learned that by going through it. And that was just always a – you almost feel like you're starting a relationship on set on your heel of like I have to like yeah. Yeah. give an excuse right from the beginning. I've just mm -hmm. met you and let me tell you about the most you know difficult thing I'm <laughs> <Yeah>. watching. <laughs> All in one moment. Do you really want to know? <laughs> no. I'll tell you. <laughs> right. I had a woman in the lobby once. I said, so how are you doing? And she goes, do you actually want to know? And yeah. I'm like, wow. <laughs> yes, I do. So, <laughs> yes. But those moments, right? It's a, We're starting easy. And it, mm -hmm. at times then we have to sidestep something that is genuinely hard because of how it begins. And I think having a place where we simply ask questions yes. versus give statements. Yes. Yeah. So how does that feel? What, what is God doing in that? How can I be praying for you? Yes. Mm -hmm. Those kind of things versus... Says, well, I knew someone who, and they just went on vacation, and <laughs> yeah. right, like you just have to relax more. <laughs> yes. Because like, telling no. a woman to relax more always yes. fixes it. Works every time. <laughs> <laughs> you chill, relax. Those are super helpful phrases. Um, yeah. So I, I, that's one thing I've learned in that of like the idea of questioning versus giving examples because mm -hmm. of having walked now infertility. 
early miscarriage, late miscarriage, adoption. I have the whole span. Mm -hmm. Surprise, pregnancies, twins. Um, yep. I know even in that spectrum of experiences I have, mine aren't yours right. or yours. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a humility to needed in those conversational moments of I'm not going to assume I know your walk. Mm -hmm. and what God has called you individually to go through. And I'm going to have the humility instead to say, so tell me more. Mm -hmm. And how beautiful would it be across our church body if, as women, we said, tell me more instead of mm -hmm. let me tell you. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe where is God encouraging that? or how? And point them back spiritually, too, yes. in those moments, because it can slip into idolatry. Yep. It can slip into depression. Mm -hmm. There are some very serious things that come hand in hand with yes. infertility in particular, yes. but mm -hmm. also in miscarriage, fear, anxiety. Um, and so it's not just, I want to know more and you leave it nebulous if you're in a relationship with the person. It's also, let's pull it to truth. But yeah. the truth isn't the hope that I'm telling you you're going to have a baby. Mm -hmm. The truth is God's character. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. In those moments. So, yeah, I, I appreciate your vulnerability in sharing those things. I, I think this is a core of my hope for the podcast is how we can grow as a body in these areas, in conversation, more intentionally, in life groups, or whatever mm -hmm. it might be in those relationships. Um, so what is a way that people could practically be helpful? Because conversations are one thing, you know, those come and go, but the people that are actually in life with you, yeah. you know, those that God has ordained to walk the path with you, they know it, they are already kind of aware of your setting. What could they practically do in different moments? Or you think back to maybe a part of your story. If, if this had happened or this did happen that was just genuinely helpful, mm -hmm. um, what advice would you give? Allie, why don't you start us out? Yeah. Well, first of all, I think the most practical way that you can love people in general mm -hmm. is to pursue your relationship with Christ, mm. like personally, <laughs> because when we are loving the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and keeping our heart personally, we will love people better. That's like mm. it's an Great overflow yep. of walking closely with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so you will love people better when you are pursuing Christ personally. Mm -hmm. So I would just say that like at a foundational level. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would also just say, like you said, to ask questions. Mm. Uh, I've had my closest friends just, I have felt loved by them saying, like, what is most helpful for you mm -hmm. in, this, mm -hmm. in this moment? And, you know, and that's led to just being able to share with people, uh, you know, if you find out you're pregnant, maybe text me mm -hmm. and, and do it, tell me that way so that... We're not in person mm -hmm. because that's harder. Infertility yeah. is weird in that sometimes people tell me and I'm like, yay, I'm so excited. And mm -hmm. sometimes people tell me and I'm like, I'm going to go weep, yeah. you know? So mm -hmm. it's just, yeah. it's very unpredictable. And mm -hmm. I heard someone else say that she shared that with um, the people in her community. And that's mm -hmm. been really helpful for me. And so just my friends asking, like, mm -hmm. what do you, how do you want me to handle this? Mm -hmm. If and when that would ever happen has just made me feel loved, you know, mm -hmm. to your point of asking questions mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, just I think people just acknowledging things that could potentially be hard has also been mm -hmm. something that's been really helpful. I will have uh, friends or family members that will text me on like child dedication Sundays. Mm -hmm. That's pretty painful for people that have lost children or are struggling to have them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or, you know, a hard sermon or just right. a conversation that maybe I was a part of and a friend will text me and just say like, I'm really sorry if that was hard for you. Mm -hmm. I just want you to know I'm praying and you don't even need to respond. Right. And, and so I think just sometimes the silence is more painful mm -hmm. than people not saying anything because it, it feels like, and this is not where people are coming from, but it feels like you're just forgotten mm -hmm. and, you know, your pain isn't worth being acknowledged. And so I think just people saying like, 
I'm sorry if that was hard for you. I want you to know that I'm thinking of you and I'm praying for you mm -hmm. and you don't even have to respond to me. And just having the permission, like, you don't even have to have the words. I just right. want you to know I'm thinking of you right. and I'm sorry. Yep. And that was probably tough. Mm -hmm. Those moments have been so impactful and helpful mm -hmm. and comforting mm -hmm. to me. Well, it makes yeah. you feel like you're not alone in yes. this. Mm -hmm. And that they know you enough to observe what might hurt. Yeah. Yeah. And which speaks to their care for you as mm -hmm. their sister or friend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. How about you, Sam? Yeah, I would say questions are a huge one as well. It can be such a lonely journey in fertility yes. and miscarriage because it's quickly forgotten by others. They don't mm -hmm. see it. They don't see what you're still continuing to struggle with. Right. Um, so people just continuing to ask questions, even like a month later, two mm -hmm. months later, um, I think is just a, a really good way to show them that you are still thinking about that baby that mm -hmm. they lost and that you um, still think of them as a mom. So, mm -hmm. you know, right. when I lost those babies, I wasn't a mom. Mm -hmm. So it was hard mm -hmm. to just, especially like you said, Child Dedication Sunday and Mother's Day mm -hmm. and all the things that come up. Um, it just starts to feel really lonely mm -hmm. if people aren't asking those questions and continuing to come back to it and small group members just pushing in and yeah. asking, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. that's always um, just the best way, I think, to feel loved. And then practically, um, soon after miscarriages, we had members of our small group bring us meals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, with the late-term miscarriage, like your milk can come in, like mm -hmm. you can have all kinds of yeah. things happen. So I had someone that knew she hadn't gone through a late-term miscarriage, but someone in her family had, so she had put together just a care package mm -hmm. of just things I might need and like might what not things? like, because uh, yeah, that might totally. speak to an example. So that was filled with pads, with um, uh, nursing pads mm -hmm. in case milk came in. Um, I remember, I think just like a blanket, you know, mm -hmm. something soft, mm -hmm. um, some food. So I think it was just like yeah. some like essential things that you but might need. But also practical in the mix. Yeah. yeah, totally. So wise. Yeah. And that was really sweet. Um, and just things I hadn't even thought about because mm -hmm. I had never had a baby. So right. I didn't know that was a possibility. Right. Um, and thankfully it didn't happen for me, but my sister-in-law would go on to have a late miscarriage mm -hmm. and that did happen for her, you mm -hmm. know, and me being able to call her and tell her that like, these are the things you might need. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just another cool way to see God just that is. working. Yeah. 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 I think that those places where we can be in with them without next necessarily trying to fix it yeah. mm -hmm. but aware enough of the need um mm -hmm. i read a book when i was going through infertility that i shared with my mom and one chapter in particular talked about a farmer who got his truck just hopelessly stuck in a ditch and his friend came along and in, with a vehicle that would not have been able to pull the truck out and instead of trying to do something he just climbed in the cab with him and stared at the ditch. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying to my mom, like, Mom, I just need you to stare at the ditch with me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, like, just spend time with me mm -hmm. and, you know, be with me in that. Mm -hmm. Like, the pres the the gift of presence is a real thing. Yeah. being And reminding them of God's presence also, but physically not being put off by pain, mm -hmm. which I think we can feel in those places. Like, it's a difficult conversation. Yeah. and Or it's one that's taken years so I'm having the same one again and again and again yes. and I used to feel like I was taking up their space in the same prayer request or that same need <laughs> mm -hmm. and yep. it and I finally had a friend a beautiful friend in those years of my life who looked at me and said Laura but this is what God's called you to mm -hmm. we're going to keep praying mm -hmm. like don't apologize and I needed I needed a friend to tell me to stop mm -hmm. apologizing that it yeah. was taking so long which was God's choice not mine and right. um, so just having those friends that are willing to point us back to truth and be there yes. and um, you know I think even with miscarriage it's helpful to write down the date of a friend's yes. due yeah. date yes. yeah. and literally on that week it doesn't have to necessarily be on that day but on that week send yep. them a little something yes. or mm -hmm. a text at the least saying I'm praying for you um, yeah. because it gives that life dignity yep. yeah. to someone you know we feel it as the mom yes. mm -hmm. um, but it does as you said feel like the world just instantaneously I remember like getting on the road thinking everyone's driving somewhere and they don't know yep. yeah they don't know I just lost a baby mm -hmm. and um of course they don't but your heart longs for someone else to acknowledge yeah. the dignity of that life so I think that's an important thing is mm -hmm. maybe a practical example too. yeah yeah and and to add to just pray absolutely pray for 
the people in your life that you know are struggling with infertility. And you know what? Maybe even couples that you don't know Mm -hmm. and maybe you don't ask, but you pray for them anyways Mm -hmm. because they may or may not be. And I have never coveted or felt my need Mm -hmm. for people around me to pray for me as much as I have in this season, particularly after our miscarriage. And because sometimes you feel like, I don't even know what to say to the Lord. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't even really know what I need. Sometimes Mm -hmm. people have asked and I'm like, I actually don't even know in this moment. And, and to just have people interceding Mm -hmm. for us has been one of the ways that we felt the most loved because sometimes we just don't know what we need. And sometimes we're just trying to survive. (laughs) Right. Absolutely. And, uh, we just need people to, to lift us up in, in prayer. Someone, I was talking to someone a couple of weeks ago and they, they brought up, you know, in, in the old Testament when Moses needs people to hold Mm -hmm. up his His arms arms. for him. Yeah. Yeah. And there are so many ways that people can do that. But for us, when when I when I've known that people are praying, it has meant a lot to mm-hmm. me. And when you know, I think Jonathan and I talked to Brian uh, not that long after our miscarriage, mm-hmm. and and he was like, "I just want you to know, like, I'm being hopeful for you, you mm-hmm. know, and not necessarily in having kids because that's not where our hope is, but just." knowing like I know it's hard for you to have Mm -hmm. hope right now and I just want you to know I have it like on behalf of you Mm -hmm. that meant so much that statement has just really like stuck with me Mm -hmm. and so I think just people forget how impactful and effective prayer is and not just praying that God would change our circumstances though that is appreciated but that they're praying for what our heart needs, yeah. right. you know, and that God would sustain us and comfort us and help us to think mm-hmm. what's true about the Lord and that we would be just vigilant in, you know, tending to our hearts mm-hmm. and not giving way to despair and yeah. things like mm-hmm. that. And praying over marriages yes, in the midst of it too. Yeah. I think that's something that the body probably needs to hear of. It is a hard thing, and it will either drive you apart or together, and it mm-hmm. has different moments where it does both. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, that's not su- a surprise when you're in it, but I think it's people tend to pray for it, like you said, a fix of the situation yeah. or for maybe your heart as a mom. And they're not necessarily – the dads get lost yeah. in it mm-hmm. at yes. times, yeah. and I think it's actually a very helpful thing for them to talk to another man who's yeah, gone yes. through it yep. uh, and acknowledge that side of it and then uh, pray for a particular peace, unity of mind yes. and mm-hmm. significant time together that isn't, it becomes your old world yeah. Yeah. and you, you do need to process, but you also need to kind of escape yes. yeah. at times too. And, yeah. and just pray over those marriages. Yes. Um, I don't, I was just, we were so young and jumping into it. It just happened all so quick in our marriage. I don't, I know I did not process the impact that would have, nor had I ever thought through that in anyone yeah. else I knew. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I have a heart for that, um, for us to be as a body caring yes. for mm-hmm. those places. And I think it should be said too, our church offers soul care. Yes. yes. And um, whether that is in any part, uh, if you're going, if you've gone through a miscarriage, you have post hormone mm-hmm. influx and all <laughs> the things, yeah. and that's yes. legit. Yes. And so I think acknowledging there's some you have real things happening here Mm -hmm. in your heart and your body and your mind. And if we as a church body need to do more than just the pray for sit with you, there's soul care also um, very much available too. So um, how can, so I want to just end with two last questions. Are there any scriptures that for you were particularly meaningful? So this is maybe speaking to the woman who's just recently gone through this or to a family member who might be caring for like something that we can point truth to because like you said we have to fight against the lies the enemy speaks and scripture is one of the best ways to do that so what were some things that you found helpful sam yeah let me i want to make sure i get it right yeah Uh, so i sometimes i'm like why was this the verse that god gave me it's a weird (laughs) one but (laughs) that's okay it's psalm 27 um, and it's some trust in chariots and some yeah. trust in horses, but I will trust in Jesus and, mm-hmm. and the Lord. Um, and it's David, and they're preparing for a big battle, I believe, from the context. And um, and he's saying that 
some people put all their trust in, in the weapons and in the people fighting and the horses and the chariots, but he trusts that God will get him through it. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the midst of our miscarriages, that was the verse that God just kept bringing back to me, that I can't put my trust in the doctor's appointments. Mm-hmm. I can't put my trust in, in the sound of the heartbeat. Mm-hmm. I can't put my trust in the symptoms that I'm experiencing or not experiencing. My trust is in the Lord yeah, and good. that he is faithful and that his character is faithful and that his faithfulness isn't dependent on whether or not I have a miscarriage. It's dependent on his character and he is faithful. Um, so God just kept bringing that verse back to me, um, in the midst of miscarriages through the miscarriages. And then when we would get pregnant again and just trusting that like God is faithful. Mm -hmm. Um, and if I put my trust in other things, I'll fall into fear. I'll fall into anxiety. Um, so I just have to keep my eyes on, on God. Allie, how about you? Uh, I think Genesis was, has mm. been, was, and is still a very uh, just comforting thing. I Because it's very tempting when you're walking through infertility to just like, no one understands. I'm alone in this. And even if you know, there's just this desire to be perfectly understood by mm-hmm. someone. Mm-hmm. I want someone that has the exact same diagnosis and has been trying just as long and all these things. But, you know, like you mentioned at the beginning, Laura, like you can have similar experiences and it is just not going to be the exact same. And so that is a faulty place to put our hope, Mm -hmm. right? And someone that just understands. And we do miss that there is someone that perfectly understands Mm -hmm. and, and like Christ does. And so I think just reading through Genesis and just, seeing that God has been walking with couples who have struggled with mm-hmm. fertility for thousands of years, you know, right. and, uh, just, and, and not, and not being comforted by like, oh, well, God is going to give me a baby because mm-hmm. he gave Abraham and Isaac and Jacob mm-hmm. and, you know, because God has not promised that my offspring would like save the people, you know, right. what that he did. And so my hope isn't in that, but it, I am comforted by the fact that God has been doing this for a long time Mm -hmm. and he understands and this is not, you know, a unique, well, like while my situation is unique Mm -hmm. to, and it is for Jonathan and I, infertility is not a unique struggle, you know, and that God understands and particularly the narrative of Hagar Mm -hmm. um, just God sees. Yes, and and just her fleeing to the desert mm-hmm. and just being there and alone and sad and God just meets her mm-hmm. there and she just says like surely you are the God that sees me. Yeah. Praise God. And just being so comforted that like God does see. Yeah. Even when it feels like no one else does and mm-hmm. that when people do see they're reflecting the fact that God sees mm-hmm. me. That's and perfect. so, and, and even just reading about Joseph and honestly, how many times he had to step away to weep. Mm-hmm. I feel very understood <laughs> by that yes. part of that, you know, narrative mm-hmm. that I just, I don't have to have it together all mm-hmm. the time. And uh, that emotions are, you know, just part of life and that Joseph still honored the Lord and trusted him and had to excuse himself to weep Mm -hmm. a few times. And that his, his understanding of the situation was so much bigger than my brothers, Mm -hmm. you know, betrayed me and sold me. And then I got thrown in jail and like Joseph Mm -hmm. had every reason to be a victim, yet he chose not to give way to a victim mentality, which I very easily can give into, but just seeing that Joseph's uh, mindset was on the bigger picture of what God was doing ultimately and not just fixated on his circumstances. So they're just really awesome nuggets Mm -hmm. of comfort and just like the people in Genesis and in the Bible, like they were real people with real problems. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And that God is not taken aback by, you know, how hard this is. He gets it. Jesus is so close to us in our in our suffering and Mm -hmm. and also uh just in first peter one uh where it talks about Mm -hmm. just our afflictions are are part of life but that they 
you know, everything, it's like light and momentary Mm -hmm. compared to what eternity Mm -hmm. is going to be. I'm not going to think about my infertility when I'm in the presence of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just like, this isn't all my life is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that passage just reminds me of like the future hope that, you know, we have that hope now, but it will be perfectly realized, Mm -hmm. you know, when we are on the other side of eternity. For all eternity. Praise God. Yes. (laughs) Yes, I, it, I've heard it said, this is our pre-life. Like, right. that's not the afterlife. This is the pre-life. Yeah. And uh, I love that. Um, I love that you find such comfort in Genesis because not everybody goes there for <laughs> comfort. <laughs> I personally love Genesis, so that's a heartwarming tale to yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I God took me to Psalm 73. I've shared that before in my yeah. story. And like the verse, whom have I in heaven but you? There's no one on earth to desire mm-hmm. you. Um the, Everything else is going to fail, but, you know, the fact in the next verse, then it says, the nearness of God is my good. And those two kind of parts of the, in that chapter of like, who do I have? Like, I need to understand, like, there's nothing else. And the nearness of God, not a nearness of a baby in my arms, Mm -hmm. not the nearness of my friend understanding me. Mm And I find it so interesting that God takes our hearts so similarly to different passages Mm -hmm. and we can transplant the false hope that the enemy whispers in our ear into those verses and then, you know, parse them correctly to say, no, not those, Mm -hmm. but this instead. You know, my hope is in God, not those things. My, his nearness is my good, not those Mm -hmm. things. Um, how faithful the spirit is to so individually speak to our hearts. Mm -hmm. And, um, I would just encourage anyone going through it to go toward the Lord Mm -hmm. and not away Mm -hmm. and let his word minister. And if that's a struggle, find someone who can point you there because our words will fail. Yes. We're not enough, but God's mm-hmm. word mm-hmm. is enough and it will never fail. Mm-hmm. Such hope. Uh, so as we finish, how can we be praying for you in this season? Um, and I'd love to kind of conclude with that. So Allie, how about you? How can we be praying? Uh, I think just <laughs> there are so many right. <laughs> things I feel like that I honestly just need prayer for, but Uh, One of the biggest things is just uh, moving forward. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we uh, actually already have our next transfer scheduled. I am not going to share when that Mm -hmm. is. Um, But just thankful that God has gotten us to a place and me physically to a place where we're able to get that scheduled again. And Mm -hmm. so I feel excited. We are Mm -hmm. excited, but we are equally terrified. Right. Because to try again means that the exact same thing could happen. And uh, so I think just that God would help Jonathan and I to trust him, obviously, and to, this is mostly me, Jonathan is a lot better about this, (laughs) but just like be in control of my thinking, to not Mm -hmm. be lazy in my thinking because Mm. I can quickly just let my mind go to just... Right. situations that are made up that mm-hmm. might happen, Correct. but I don't know if they're going to. And and so just that God would help me to think things that are true mm-hmm. and to dwell on God's character instead of getting what I want. Yeah. And also, God has just been impressing on my heart the the idea, the, the role that we play as stewards in this mm-hmm. life. And that's something that I wish I would have thought more about the first time around because you know being a mom isn't ultimately like about me Mm. it's about the babies Mm -hmm. you know and so I've just been really challenged with like who am I making this about Mm -hmm. and so the Holy Spirit's just been convicting me you know just to have this mindset of like, I am a steward of these embryos that God has given. Mm -hmm. It's not my job to make sure that they, you know, it's a viable pregnancy. Mm -hmm. I can't control that. There are things that I can do to love them by being healthy and to take care of myself. But my hope isn't in what I choose Mm -hmm. to like how much caffeine I consume or Mm -hmm. not consume, you know, whatever. Um, And so that God would just help Jonathan and I to look at this as God is using this in our lives 
to to love, mm-hmm. to sacrificially mm-hmm. love our embryos, mm-hmm. and that no matter the outcome, we are loving them and we're mm-hmm. giving them dignity Absolutely. by the opportunity to live life. Mm-hmm. And God is the one that is in control of whether that's going to be time here on this earth or just to be with him. Mm-hmm. So just that God would help me to think more about being a steward Mm -hmm. than getting what I want Mm -hmm. because it's really easy after you've been walking it for so long to just, your end goal is like, I just want a baby. I just want one, like just one. I I mean, I want more, but just one would be great, you know? But again, that's putting my hope in the wrong place. Right. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's the biggest way that people could pray is just that our thinking would be right and that God would just prepare us to to hold our next transfer with open Mm -hmm. hands, you know, and we desire that it's successful. So we're going to pray to that end, but with the understanding like God Mm -hmm. is still good and he is in control, but we will still ask for what we desire. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember processing through how much I wanted God to be my deliverer and not many people pray for him to be our sustainer. Yeah. And yeah, so we do desire the end and it's not bad to pray for the deliverance. Um, but then equally praying for the sustaining in the midst. So I appreciate your vulnerability on that. Sam, how about you? I think very similarly when I think about getting pregnant again, it's just filled with fear. Mm -hmm. Um, especially since we did have another miscarriage earlier this year, just thinking like, uh, I thought Finn was like the fix, you know, Mm -hmm. like my body is fixed now and I'll be fine. So then to experience that, it's like, Oh no, it might still continue. And, um, so I, my mind can easily go to fear, to, Mm -hmm. to anxiety. Um, so that, and again, just I just need to keep my mind on on who God is. Mm-hmm. And if I do that, then I am not focused on myself. I'm not, mm-hmm. again, going to those worst case scenarios mm-hmm. and thinking about things that haven't even happened and like right. placing them into my future. It's like running running into the future and bringing mm-hmm. all those worries into today. Mm-hmm. It doesn't do any do you any good and yeah. God calls us to not do that. So um, to keep my mind focused on God, to stay in the word, to... Um, to be spending intentional time with him so that my focus is on him and on wherever he, wherever the the journey takes us, like God is faithful. Well, let me just close our time with a quick word of prayer then. Mm -hmm. Dear Lord, we do acknowledge that you are the creator God and you are good. You are good in all things, even in the places where you redeem the pain and the hurt that we are called to walk. And God, may you be honored in those places and spaces within our lives, within these women's lives, within the church. Um, God, may you be honored in how we grow to love and support each other better in these places. And then, Lord, I do pray that you would uh, just do a work in both Allie and Sam's life, their bodies, their families, um, help them to trust you, to lean toward you, and to see their role as stewards, as worshipers in the midst of waiting. And um, God, we ask for your path forward with hope, knowing that you are good in all your answers. And uh, we pray these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Ladies, thanks for joining us. And we look forward to the next time that we have another chance to do a podcast together to learn how to love your sister better. Mm